Yeah, indeed, it's a uh, governor, and other. it's a pleasure to be here. And I think we have, with it, any of these discussions, we have different terminologies going around. And I think part what we heard in the morning panel, we want to be holistic, we want to connect parts, but yet we are in a world and in the UNFCCC world where we have put aside mitigation is here, adaptation is there, forests are here, agriculture is there, and we are here coming from the concern that it is about people and it is about vulnerability side of it. And we are, I guess, all of us coming to this room here interested in how can we reconnect what has been artificially <coughs> separated. Yeah, and in that sense, uh, we are here from the research side organizations that represent forest and the trees and the agroforestry, and we are trying to reconnect that with other parts of the agricultural landscape and the livelihoods. <coughs> and we've been working on, let's say, within the adaptation world, we've seen two quite different approaches. And well, I, I guess we all know it. for the first 10 years within UNFCCC we could not talk about adaptation because the only important thing was mitigation and we need to stop climate change so that we don't have to adapt. And it took about 10 years to realize that we are not effectively in, in that agenda and we, we change has not been stopped so we have to adapt. But yet, with this adaptation, we have two diff very different approaches. The first is the engineering approach. And you can only adapt to something if you know what the new conditions will be. At the moment, we have this climate. And at some point in the future, we have that climate. And adaptation is to get this from what you do now to what you should do in the future climate. And so you need the direction of change before you can adapt. The second perspective on adaptation is that it is about vulnerability in variable environments. At the moment climate is variable and we have in any place it is never the average temperature and we ne no year has the average rainfall and we deal with quite a lot of stuff. Uh, and okay, for many parts in the world the clear predictions are that variability will increase. We're not quite sure of the trends if you look for different parts. Well, what will get wetter, what get drier? In many cases, one model predicts this get wetter, that get drier, and the other one will shift it around. So there's a, a lot of uncertainty about the, the directional trends in important things like, like rainfall. Uh, but it's very likely that variability will increase. So how do we currently deal with variability? And is adaptation then? <laughs> Uh, strengthening what we currently do to deal with variability and in that sense being ready for the future. Now if you ask people on the ground how do we deal with variability, how do we deal with the, the worst years that you knew about this and, and that, then of course we, we very often get to yeah, concepts of diversity. We survive because we don't specialize on one thing only, but we have a bit of this and we have a bit of that and we have access to the forest and we have a farm and we have some trees and we have this and that and it is the diversity that is the primary way uh, people are coping with variability and coping with uncertainty and in that sense adaptation <coughs> to increased variability means first of all well, maintaining the diversity that we currently have and strengthening diversity within the life group systems and resisting the temptations to, to specialize and most of the time, adaptation the development has been about specializing and get rid of all that old stuff and, and, and do the one thing that is best for you. And we currently see actually a lot of increase of vulnerability <coughs> under the name of development. Yeah? So if we then talk about what is ecosystem-based adaptation, well, some people say ecosystem-based adaptation is that the forest on top of the hill will protect you from this and that. And it is about keeping the forest out there. Uh, but maybe it is at least as important the, the ecosystem that is well, still very well integrated with the farms uh, and that can provide that buffer function. So when we talk with the people in the villages and we talk about what they do, and 
if you ask anybody, is the climate changing? Yeah, I've got the climate change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we don't think that's a very valid research approach. It is more valid to talk about shocks, shocks about what, what has been changing in the past, uh, how did you cope with it, how did you deal with it. And simply said, if you cannot deal with the current variability, well, then forget about climate change. The problem is you cannot handle the current variability. If you can handle the current variability between dry years and wet years and hot and cold, well, then you're pretty pretty robust and you're pretty well <coughs> suited for quite a bit of the climate change that is coming. One point on that, and that is, I don't know how many more minutes you want to give me. Uh, Please, three minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It is, and that, that is that challenge that we have with the climate data. And I don't know whether you've ever looked at where climate data come from. The climate data come from weather stations. And synoptic weather stations, about 100 years ago, people found out that trees are disturbing the measurements. So we collect our climate data from places that are far enough from trees. So trees are not disturbing <laughs> the temperature, they're not disturbing the wind speed, they're not disturbing the moisture. So we, we get clean data for landscapes without trees. But that's the data base that we have for climate. That is, our models are calibrated with data that come from that type of stations. Are they able to predict, well, we talk about downscaling, are they able to predict the influence of trees on the microclimate? How much it matters to have more trees in the city, more trees in the Actually not yet. Yeah. So we have we are worried about a two degree warmer world. But what is the effect of tree cover on maximum temperature? Maybe three degrees, maybe four degrees. So we have when we come down to that level, and if we really worry about <coughs> temperature effects on our crops, the trees in that landscape, the trees on farm, they still actually influence the conditions where your crops are growing to that same degree. So there is a gap in the science on that front, and we're missing out an important dimension of how farmers can adapt, will adapt, and what is the relevance of these scattered <coughs> trees within the landscape on the climatic conditions, on the performance of the crops and the livestock and the people themselves. And <coughs> we want to yeah, bring to you this discussion is ecosystem-based adaptation comes at different scales. It is about the whole landscape and maintaining the relevant functions of forest within the whole landscape. It's also about the trees on the farm and it is about the elements that are close to the livelihood. And we need to connect these parts. And adaptation is not about doing something new. It is about stopping the ongoing trend to simplify, retain the diversity that we have. Uh, and okay, I had four R's, retain the diversity that we have. Uh, restore the buffers in the landscape where we have lost them, reward multifunctionality, and reduce the barriers between the different policy domains. Reduce the barrier between mitigation and adaptation, reduce the barriers between forest, agriculture, and actually start talking about the lives of the people in the landscapes we care about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, for keeping to the eight minutes. And uh, if we come back to the, what we learned uh, in the plenary uh, this morning, uh, and if you talk about common sense, if you look at, at the village, every, almost everywhere in the tropics, and especially in dry Africa, <coughs> if you look at where the people are gathering, they are not gathering close to the weather station, they are gathering <laughs> under a tree. And, and so, so is the cattle. You know, and generally speaking, you see the cars are just below the tree. Oh, yeah, you are going to talk to us about ecosystem-based adaptation, yes. some stories, and specifically a story of the Lake Fagibin. Yeah, exactly. I welcome you to this uh, session, and I would like to share with you today some experiences in C4, in our work in C4 about uh, adaptation, and especially about ecosystem-based adaptation. Minor was already mentioning this, uh, but just to make sure that we are speaking about the same, I just want to uh, tell you how we define ecosystem-based adaptation in our work in C4. We look at ecosystem-based adaptation as strategies, but also policies which take into account ecosystems where people uh, are in the process to adapt. 
So we are trying to have in C4 a kind of human-centered adaptation analysis, even although we use it as a base adaptation, and sometimes it sounds like it, it is eco-centered, but it is not. We try to understand both forest for adaptation, but also adaptation for forest. They look at ecosystems and try to understand how to make them resilient, that they can uh, be resilient for future extreme events, but also to look at people, how they can use sustainability in these ecosystems to adapt and to cope with climate change. We realize that there is little evidence about the role of ecosystem-based adaptation to adapt. And then we did a kind of review analysis to try to understand more this issue. And we come out with uh, six stories about adaptation. I will just cite them and then I will focus on one because this is more relevant for the audience here. So we have these six stories. The first one is about product. So forest product for people to adapt when it comes to extreme events. So in the Sahel especially, we have, uh, we have evidences, there are evidences in the literature also, that people, when it comes to drought, when, uh, for example, crop production uh, fails, they use forest services uh, for nutrition, I mean, like food security, but also to generate income to get, uh, to get a kind of income for this short period when they are uh, really uh, under extreme conditions. The second one, the second story, is the role of trees outside the forest, actually. So it was kind of patterns in West Africa. When we speak about deforestation, it's a little bit more complicated because when people cut, uh, cut the trees, they always keep three or four spaces which are multi-purpose spaces. And therefore, we have this kind of landscapes which are pikelets, and they have agricultural trees. And there are evidences that this system is uh, really efficient because the trees contribute to uh, uh, better uh, agricultural production under this system. The third story is about uh, watersheds. And there is also there a lot of evidence showing how watershed can stabilize soil. Uh, yes, uh, no, trees can stabilize soil around uh, watershed. The fourth story is about coast pr uh, protection, trees by uh, protected coast regions. The five stories is about cities, the role of trees to regulate the climate in cities. And the last, last story is about regional uh, climate regulation of uh, forests and trees. I will concentrate on the story about agriculture and dry lands because that's more relevant here. But I want to show you one slide. This slide is about the Lac Fagibi, where uh, we did uh, uh, a study analyzing vulnerability and climate change. Lac Fagibi was one of the biggest, or the biggest lake actually in uh, West Africa. And it uh, dried out after the droughts of the 80s. It began to, it, it was a process. It, it was not one, just uh, one year, but it was a process of drying of the lake. Here you see two pictures. One is uh, 1978 and one is 2006. What happens in the lake is that in the beginning, a lot of development agencies were concentrated when the lake was there about having kind of an intensified agriculture around the lake, rice production. And then suddenly this lake disappears. And before it disappears, other agencies, other projects tried to protect the lake with a tree, which is Prosopis, which maybe you know, it's a very, very invasive species. So now what happens is that after the, the lake dried out, we have a forest. So you see here that is a Prosopis forest. And here you see the natural regeneration with Acacia. Now we have communities who are in the beginning using uh, uh, water ecosystems and using agricultural products. Now they have a forest. So how they do deal with this? And we realize that there is a big, uh, a big issue around techniques. For example, women from around the lake are trying to, to produce chapel with the prosopis. But there is a lack of capacity building of uh, market to, to sell this, uh, this chapel. And then there is another, that is only the part of the story at the local level. At the national level, of course, they have also their plans for the lake. And the plan for the lake is to refill the lake with water. So there, there is a big project trying to, <coughs> to open the channels, because this lake is actually feeded by the Niger River, which is here. 
and they are opening those channels to bring water back to the lake. And the question is, here is, if we don't understand actually why the lake disappeared, how can we sh be sure that it's a sustainable project? And then we will bring again people who are now trying to adapt with the forest back to a system in the past which will destroy actually the forest. And this is, a, this is also <coughs> to show how important it is that at the national level, there is a landscape approach to adaptation. Uh, I will go now to another slide to show just a picture from Burkina Faso, just to try to make a little bit this adaptation, the complexity from the local level to explain it. Here we see two storage, I hope it's the name, Grony. Um, so when people put their cereals to, to store them, and th those ones are collective storage, it means there are several families who use them. And what we see here is the traditional one, which is round, and you see that is a grass people use to, to, for the roof. Now this one is the new one, because this plant now doesn't exist. This plant disappears because of the drought, but also because of the pressure with animals. So we can say, okay, there's no problem, but there is a problem, because people are saying that they, they have big losses in their, in their uh, cereals when they put them there because they are using, uh, for the roof, they are using uh, metals, aluminum. So the, the microclimate inside this storage is changing because people, they don't have this possibility to have this roof. What happens actually is, of course, because at the, at the local level, people, they have already the landscape approach. So they are trying to get this plant somewhere else. It is only exists in protected areas, so in the forest which is protected. And then we have the problem of access. So people, they don't have access to this plant, and there is a lot of conflict with the foresters in order to, to keep this here. But I think our, our objective or aim is to keep people having their own local strategies like this one and avoid maladaptation and food insecurity because of this. So we need actually at the, at the national level especially, we need to bring those experiences. We need more evidences about uh, comparing ecosystem-based adaptation to other strategies in order to to um, to explain and also to uh, because the policymaker will ask you why why I should have ecosystem based adaptation and not uh, refilling the lake with water and we have to be able to give these answers and therefore we need more evidences but then we need more research and then we need more money. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. thank you very much. Thank you. You just have seen the, the problem of maladaptation and what happens when you just come with some external ID to a place where you don't necessarily know and you, you are dealing in fact with real people's lives. And it's very important because you cannot change the way people are behaving or the way people learn in less than a generation. So we are going to have constant problem if we don't really discuss with the local people and see what they know, what they want to do, how they can do it. And, and, if we understand the context. Now, <clears throat> the last point by Uria was sort of a very, very good transition because we have one policy maker here yeah, in the room, governor of Cali <laughs> Central Kalimantan, and, and, and this morning, I don't know if you were in, in the room, but policy maker was some sort of said that you have no common sense. <laughs> well, I'm sure that Andras has a lot of common sense. There may be exceptions. There may be exceptions. <laughs> And, and he will tell us a, a story of a totally different ecosystem, which is the central Kalimantan and, and the problem with the pit swamp. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I'm really happy today because uh, in my capacity as a governor, I can explain or maybe I can uh, give uh, my experience, especially in the central Kalimantan. Uh, Sutra Kalimantan has already published its uh, Red Plus strategy and also action plan in this year. And as the on red, red map for the Red Plus implementation, we also have uh, already as a legal umbrella for this strategy is a governor regulation. 
2012. And the, but the basic idea of the strategy is a community-based red plus uh, implementation. The community is uh, our door and the main player and the main beneficiary of red plus activities. And we also, as the first uh, pilot province, selected uh, for national red plus program implementation. We have chosen to take an approach that goes beyond uh, carbon. Central Kalimantan is not uh, only focusing on carbon sequestration alone, but uh, encompassing many important uh, benefits. Uh, in this way, combining landscape-based mitigation and adaptation is key, is, is key to achieving sustainable development for people living today and for our next generations. It is not a business as usual development scenario yet. There are people who are still assuming that province-wide red plus is a simple way of bundling and compiling existing small-scale projects or even worse the way of developing and having more small-scale activities all over the area one part of the problem i see here is that we are probably focusing too much on technical issues related to international carbon mitigation scheme such as MRV, nesting approaches, emission displacement, etc. And forgot what is really needed to achieve sustainable and meaningful change on the ground. This kind of change can uh, only happen if we take into consideration the livelihoods of local communities. Global environmental change is uh, already leaving visible effects on our region. Rainfall patterns are getting more irregular and extreme weather events are more common. Both of these factors directly affect the lives of communities as it bears difficulties for agricultural activities and thus affects Food security. But one particular effect that is clearly felt through forests and pit fires. Although it is often human agents that cause these fires, scientists agree that with rising average temperatures and irregular pattern on rainfall, fires will be even more likely and also last longer. This is why we recognize the essential link between humans <coughs> and landscapes in our strategy, taking into consideration the footprint people live on the planet, but also the harmful impact of environmental change of people. In uh, developing the provincial strategy, my appreciation goes to C4 and ICRAF because our team, especially writing team, use their publication as a reference. For instance, agroforestry land use is preferable for many good reasons and indeed agroforestry in the foundation of local community <coughs> livelihood. This understanding leads to fair strategic approach and action plans including financial incentives and this, in this incentive for the floating rural-based green investment. Adapting to climate change in landscape river means work encompassing various land use, <coughs> land status, land cover, and land tenure elements. It is not simply about harmonizing or even stratifying the utilization of forest land and agriculture land. <coughs> the, challenge of, the challenge is overwhelming, not to mention the manifold problem <coughs> with the spatial planning process. Having a good and standardized 
This map is this map is a must, hence the one map system comes into place in uh, Indonesia. It is uh, crucial to have all of the things mentioned before of late in just in one map system. This will facilitate participatory land use planning and mapping process on the next step. Here the aim goes beyond the idea of mapping excess tenure or right tenure while trying to enlarge legal access to the community to various land use and land status at the same time all the stakeholders need to sit together to decide what is the better land use in dealing with the increasing problem related to climate change at their own territory. Furthermore, this process will assist strategic partnership with private and state enterprises, supporting sustainable livelihood and enabling condition for government's community support schemes in Indonesia, we call it Hutan Desa or uh, Village uh, Forestry. Hutan Tanaman Rakyat in Indonesia, it's been a community based of forest plantation, and also Hutan Rakyat in English, a uh, human community, sorry, community forestry. <laughs> Smallholder estate revitalization, revitalization, land tackling program, etc. And for your information, Central Kalimantan province has an active local ordinance and also governor regulation on tribal land tenure as well as local ordinance on sustainable plantation business. Now we also discussing with our parliament, our local parliament about the mining, mining uh, especially for the mining, sustainable mining. Once the greater access to the various land resources granted, sense of belonging is growing and in turn community-based fire management and community-based forest monitoring will be possible. This monitoring and fire management activities are in turn crucial to adapt to a rapidly, rapidly changing environment. Forest fires, particularly pit fires and degraded pit swamp forests are expected to become more likely in the province with the longer dry season. These fires threaten human life, habitats and ecosystem. Methods to prevent and control them have to happen on a landscape level. I am thankful that the broad implementation of Red Plus allow us to embark on the transition to a greener economy leading to a more sustainable management of landscape. Uh, for all things mentioned before, the need for strategic partnership, the need for affirmative policy and action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. So we, we have the position of a policymaker that is seeing something coming from outside Red Plus and adapting it at the context of the Calim Central Kalimantan uh, province. <coughs> now we will see how the technical world is answering this request from the society and, and the policy of Central Kalimantan. <coughs> and Graham Applegate will present us uh, the issue that they are, some of the issues that they are dealing with in the KFCP project. Graham? Uh, just to follow on what the, uh, the governor has already said, um, in relation to fire, adapting to fire um, from these degraded peatlands, we'll outline some of the ideas and some of the practices that we're implementing through the KFCP to try to um, mitigate um, and uh, those effects and also to work with communities um, so that they can actually um, solve some of these problems caused by, by the fires themselves. Um, for those people who don't know about Indonesia, the Tropical peatlands in Indonesia, which are a huge carbon uh, source of carbon, occupy around 22 million hectares. 
Indonesia. Well, a quarter of Indonesia's uh, peatlands are protected or conserved. About three and a half million hectares are forested, leaving a large area remaining in a very degraded condition and okay. still in need of rehabilitation. Stand up. <coughs> these, um, these degraded peatlands contribute to about 50% of um, Indonesia's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the total amount. And the areas I'm particularly referring to are very similar to this part of the Central Kalimantan X Mega Rice Project, where about a million hectares were cleared and drained for a, uh, a rice production. These lines here represent um, large canals. So with new developments, not only in the physical and in the social sciences, um, we've got an improved understanding of these hydrological processes in these degraded peatlands. And uh, these, this has allowed us to have a more science-based solution to assist and work very closely with these local communities to rehabilitate some of these very degraded areas. And as, we, as I said before, the science has indicated that there's small canals even within the forested landscape which are having a detrimental effect um, on, on by drying out the forests and also causing large emissions. So as Robert said, one project that's been developed um, is the Kalimantan Forest and Climate Project, which is a partnership between the Government of Australia and the Government of Indonesia. And one of the aims was it was, as, it was designed not as a project per se, but as an initiative to demonstrate a credible and equitable and effective approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the amount of deforestation and further degradation, but particularly focused on the, the peatlands. As I said before, these degraded peatlands um, emit probably up around 50% of Indonesia's um, greenhouse gases. So it's a very, very significant part. And as the, the governor correctly pointed out, it's not so much the, gas, the greenhouse gas emissions that are a problem for the local people, but it's, it's all the fire, it's all the smoke and the haze caused by these peat fires, um, which emit very noxious gases. Um, it has huge de um, detrimental effects on the economy at certain times of the year. Uh, it causes boat accidents on the Kapuas River. It stops aeroplanes from landing, uh, and the health problems are enormous. So it's more than just about greenhouse gas emissions or, or uh, reducing them. It's really about improving the livelihoods, partic particularly the people in this part of the world. Um, the KFCP area is working, as I said, in the central Kalimantan X mega rice area. And we're looking at a peak dome. And here's where the, um, the, the landscape or the, the site uh, or the watershed approach comes in. This is a, a whole peat dome. For those who don't understand, the, 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 the dome actually, the, the peat actually rises like this between this river system and this river system. So the middle there is about 10 to 12 metres higher than it is there or there. It's very difficult to see, but nevertheless, that has profound impacts on the way we uh, would go about the rehabilitation. So the destruction of these peat swamp forests and subsequent lowering of the water table when you when you dig canals into the peat you lower the water table um, and that that causes rapid subsidence which is both from oxidation and compaction pretty much those two and this has a profound effect on the topography the hydrology and more importantly the lives of, and the of livelihoods of these communities that live along the rivers um, and so what's happening in, in particularly the areas around these, um, these, these canals here, the oxidation and the drying is much more exacerbated. So not only do you have a, a, a dome effect here, but you have a mini dome effect on these, these canals, which makes the whole rehabilitation so much more difficult. Um, however, with the greater understanding and with, with some of the, the technologies that are available to us now, such as LIDAR and some ground truthing, We've been able to develop a canal blocking system which goes beyond just building dams but relies on um, a, a technique which involves four components such as these compacted peat dams, palisades, infilling. The idea is to fill in those canals and to plant flood tolerant species in the canals to reduce the, um, the or increase the hydrological roughness which slows the water down and allows sedimentation. 
And so this, this work is now being undertaken in KFCP, with working very closely with communities. Um, probably, I think up to three quarters of the amount of effort that's going into the canal blocking is with communities. So as red is an incentive-based approach, um, the, that's how we're doing this. We've, got, we've developed um, village agreements, which are uh, agreements between the project and the various village, villages operating along this area to implement this program. Um, the other area that we're looking at in terms of the livelihoods, which I should add, is inter intimately related to the rehabilitation. As I think a couple of speakers have said already, it's no use working in the forest if we don't relate it back to livelihoods. So the two are intimately related and we can't have successful rehabilitation activities unless we have very sound and sustainable livelihood programs. And that's been a lesson and Arta will talk a little bit more about that in the issues uh, market issues session later on about the work that we're doing with the livelihoods in this side of the world, this part of the of the dome. The, so these interventions, just to finish up Robert, these interventions including the canal blocking are undertaken based on incentive uh, payments which are managed by the communities themselves. And I should emphasize that there's been a system developed where they manage and um, the, the actual process and, and the payments for doing a lot of this work and for also the livelihood program. So it's in the hands of the villagers. And this um, consultative process has really culminated in what I call these village agreements, uh, which respect, uh, as we're all trying to do, the, the local values, the land use rights of, of the people that live here. They have rights access across there. Their villages go not only here, but across the landscape here. One village in particular, Mantangaihulu, its, its village area goes up this way. So it's, and the others are more or less across here. So we've, we've done that while maximising the community inputs and at the same time as I said before, we're improving the livelihoods of the, the main settlements which are along this river. That's, thanks, Mr. Jim. I guess we, we have seen in, with this uh, central Kalimantan example of <coughs> how blurred are the boundary between mitigation and adaptation. Uh, sort of talking about something which is presented as a red plus project, but in fact has a lot of activity in terms of landscape scale restoration mm -hmm. and adaptation to uh, local co new create, newly created local condition. And how do you involve the, the local people in, in, in trying to, to manage and and to deal with this new condition. So I, I guess we, we, we can also... As addition information, yes. sure. <laughs> yeah. as addition information, uh, in order to rehabilitation of the, uh, this project, especially uh, joined with uh, KLCP, we uh, also have a master plan. The master plan... For Pitland. Okay. Sorry. For Pitland. Yes, for Pitland. For the whole mega Yes, for, yeah. for the whole uh, for the whole mega rise, 1.4. We have already have a master plan, and up to now, we still have a lot of problem about how to implement the master plan because uh, KFCP only a part of uh, 1.4 million. I think it's about 200, 100, 120,000 yes. hectares. That's very small. So, on this occasion, I would like also to invite all of you to come together, to sit together. Because I always say that we are in one group. For everywhere, if we talk about the climate change, it's time for us to in one group. Thank you very much. So maybe we can have some ten minutes for question to, to the to the panelists and, and after my name we propose us, uh, some way forward for the discussion. Please uh, stand up, tell who you are, and ask your question or make a comment. Thank you very much. My name is Moses Taylor from Makerere University. 
I'm uh, happy about the presentation, especially. I think mine was general. I was synthesizing all the principles of uh, ecosystem based approach for adaptation um, and also uh, towards the end, more practical ways that it has been uh, implemented, like using the incentive based approach at the village level, the different case studies. So it was all kind of coming together. Uh, now, the challenge that I see um, is that um, ecosystem based approach requires more or less, it's like upscaling, it's more like coming from uh, the national or top down approach in order for it to work, if it is work for the countries, because the case studies and these projects are only on parts of the area. But the question is, if we want to take it to scale uh, for the different ecosystems that have different vulnerabilities, uh, for them to be able to adapt <coughs> from all these case studies, what's that kind of model that can take it to scale? Because if you look at like the village-based approach where the communities themselves are managing the incentives, to be able to train and bring a community to the level of managing uh, the incentives in a sustainable manner, it requires a lot of efforts. So I'm sure it can work at that scale, but how about if we would like it to go on for the different systems? How can this model then work on national level where people have to, because they have to adapt to different, um, different shocks? Thank you very much. Someone from the panel wants to answer, or you, <coughs> you have more questions? Mark? Thank you, Robert. Um, I just uh, I think it's always important to identify your uh, allies in the landscape when you're working on these kinds of things. The more allies you have who, have, who, have, who sympathize or share your objectives, the better it is. And uh, our colleague from the Sahel, I think you're, you said you're from, where are you from? So I can, myself, I'm from Algeria, Algeria. but the study was in Northern Mali. Okay, in Northern Mali. You, you said something which really struck enough for me because I work mostly with protected areas and we can often be seen as enemies of these kinds of things. But in fact, uh, the case study you have right here on the screen where you, dem you, you indicated that the grasses used by the people were now gone because of overgrazing or something to this effect. And the people are now turning to the only place where the grasses still exist, which is, was the protected forest next door. So the people in charge of protected forests are not very happy to see that. So the people in charge of these protected forests, which are often part of the landscape, are very keen on seeing this kind of work happening outside of their protected forests. And they, they could be seen as allies to bring into this, this, this discussion. Um, and this is a, a type of movement I'm trying to promote myself from where I sit. I, I work with the World Heritage Center. So we want to see, we want to support, we want to encourage the, the landscape uh, approach um, so that the, the resources that are becoming more and more scarce, perhaps driven by climate change or perhaps driven by, by uh, you know, perhaps it, 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 not optimal use of resources there, um, come back so that there's less pressure on those protected areas. So there's, you have partners there in, in, in the landscape that we should identify in all efforts in dealing with these issues. So this is not necessarily a question, but rather a, a statement. Just, just a point of clarification. Um, under the District of Provincial Land Use Plan, this is protection forest. There you go. So it's it's not conservation forest, it's not production forest, although <coughs> at the national level they might be moving that way, but certainly at the district and the provincial level, this is designated in the current version of the yes. land use plan as, as protection forest, which does allow access for th such things as non-timber forest products uh, and other uses. So okay, thank you. It's not locked up. Yeah, um, Kevin Henry with Care International, and I've actually been working recently on research looking at the impacts of changes in rainfall patterns on food security and human migration. But my question kind of goes to, you know, we talked about, we started about talking about the need to bring adaptation and mitigation perspectives together and avoiding these kind of false dichotomies, or at least exaggerated dichotomies. 
But there's another one, you know, you, where you're using the language of ecosystem-based adaptation, and there's a, this, the same thing is going on there because organizations like mine have been promoting community-based adaptation, and then so then you have what I, again I think is a false dichotomy. So CARE's part of a, a group of organizations that's trying to put forward an ecosystems and livelihoods-based mm -hmm. approach to adaptation. And I really think more and more we need to move in that direction because there's a tendency, if you use ecosystem-based approaches, to again polarize or dichotomize the community uh, and pit organizations that have more of a conservation lens against those that have more of a poverty you know, and community lens. So I think you know, you've got to have the community and you've got to have ecosystem health. The two have to go together. And ecosystems and livelihoods also have to be made compatible. So I'd, I'd be interested in feedback on that because you were clear. You did, when you described your approach to ecosystem-based uh, adaptation, you did talk about bringing the community perspective in. But still, you're using the language of, of ecosystem-based uh, adaptation. Thank you. So we can have the panelists answering. So we had something about the ecosystem-based adaptation and scale issue, something about identifying the allies in, in the landscape, and something about what do you mean exactly by ecosystem-based adaptation? Where, is the, where are the people? Who wants to start? Yes. Uh, in my experience, in my experience, especially for the big plan, master plan is a very, very important. In uh, my country, if you want to rehabilitate, if you want to talk about the, how to open and how to close the canal, master plan is a very, very important. And for example, like a KFCP project in the Central Kalimantan, it's only a part of our project. We have a lot of that. So in my opinion, and also in my experience, we start from the master plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I will start maybe with the, the last question. But I really am happy that you raised this issue because, of course, we have different, always different uh, names we give to different concepts. But sometimes when you look at the concept, when you look at their principles, you realize that we are not far, or they are not far from each other. And I think there is a need, and I totally agree with you, to look at those all uh, like community-based adaptation, ecosystem-based adaptation. What does this mean? What is the difference? And I think, therefore, I stress this in the beginning of my presentation, that saying ecosystem-based adaptation, at least how we use it in our work in C4, is not being uh, is always taking communities in in the middle of the of the analysis. So we, for example, in this case in Mali, uh, I didn't. Uh, speak about it, but we had a kind of uh, strategies analyzing the adaptive and coping strategies. We had very different uh, workshops with women, with men, with older, with younger people. So we tried to take this and to bring it in the ecosystem-based adaptation because ecosystem-based adaptation is actually both. It's about livelihoods, it's about communities, but it's also about ecosystem which also we cannot neglect because it is important that we take also the resilience of the systems. If we don't, we, we, yeah, the sustainability of our work will be uh, a question, and so we need both. But I totally agree with you that sometimes we have too much words to say the same, actually. And we need work to, to, to maybe to, to sit and to put all these concepts together and maybe come with one concept as you, you propose and then take it and, Therefore, we can compare, we can exchange, it would be much more efficient. Yes. And the other question, maybe it was not really a question, it was a comment from the Mark. And I, uh, I also, I'm also happy that people can find this, uh, this plant in the forest. <coughs> but the problem is that then we have to think about uh, how our forest, uh, what is the <coughs> awareness of this forest? 
I think we, because of this case, of this uh, of the climate change and climate variability, we need to move more to an adaptive governance of forests. For example, the kind of flexibility to say, okay, there are protected areas, but maybe there is a kind of how to manage this forest with people that they can take a number of kilos uh, from this uh, these spaces per year. What happens <coughs> actually is that, of course, because of uh, some local forestry agents in the region, they use this opportunity to, to make pressure on people. And we have some villagers saying to us they have to pay uh, seven or ten uh, chickens uh, to get these spaces, uh, these plants, uh, to, to build their houses. And they have to come every day with chicken if they need this plant. And I think that is where we can upscale this at the, at the national <coughs> level. Yeah. Can, I, can I just respond to that? Uh, just well, my issue is you said that the grasses were formerly available in the landscape, yeah. but they're no longer available now. Is that, uh, isn't that an indicator of a, an unsustainable yeah, development? Yeah. So we're relying on the last bits of area. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it seems to me that's an indicator that there's something wrong, that's and opening up the forest to <coughs> get to that plant is, is, is a, a dead-end road. It's no, it's no longer will be sustainable. Yeah, yeah, and we should be trying to get that plant back exactly. into the landscape, in yeah. a healthy agricultural landscape, so as opposed to opening up the forest, which is a protected area, when I, from what I understand. Yeah, we so. have to work on both. I mean, we have to, uh, to work on, on like, uh, how to cope in uh -huh. a very urgent situation. Of course, of course. But I agree with you that we have to work on restoration, okay. too. Yeah. yeah, just a few things on this taking it to scale and, and, and what is the appropriate scale of intervention and clearly if we deal with something like these peatlands you need to have a master plan of what happens with the water because the peatlands respond at that scale and there's a, there's a dominant thing coming from the <coughs> biophysical part that needs to, the human scale has to <coughs> pick that up. In other cases that is not, not as clear. Um, we've been trying, okay, we have too many words, sometimes we try to combine words, so we have mitigation and adaptation as separate words, and then we combine them and we got mythic adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> and then our Swahili speakers were very happy because miti is tree, yeah. forest, yeah? So then we actually combine the concept of mitigation, adaptation, and trees and forest in the landscape in one go. We, only when the, the whole thing of the NAMA came up, the nationally appropriate mitigation action, action we played with the words and we came with the NAMA LAMA GAMA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not about nationally appropriate mitigation actions okay. if they are not linked with what is locally appropriate. So we need the locally appropriate adaptation mitigation actions. And again, though they don't make sense if there is no gamma, is that if we don't have globally appropriate mitigation actions at the other scale. So we say nama lama gamma as a way to, say it is about, there's no, the solution is never at a single scale, it is how we get this cross scale part. And I think from, from the Central Kalimantan story from the governor, that's a very interesting, important level between the national scale that is talking here at UNFCCC and the livelihoods that we talk about and it is only when we can make these connections actually work that, that we can make progress. It's not an answer. But <laughs> well, um, um, the governor talked before about this master plan and it's really a master plan about the how to rehabilitate and rehabilitate meaning not just the physical aspects but but the social and the community aspects. A lot of the, the, the diet people living in the ex mega rice have been quite traumatized by the 97 uh, 95 to 97 events when one million hectares was cleared, drained and burnt in a two year period. Incredible. So these these people have been quite traumatized. There's been a number of other people coming in promising this, promising that. Um, so they're really quite uh, project shy, they're very skeptical, um, and it's, it, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very interesting place to try and look at the issues around Red Plus, and that's what we're trying to do. As I pointed out before, it's not a project, we're looking at methodologies, developing different methodologies, not only for the, re the physical rehabilitation of that, but what do you do um, and how do you incorporate local communities and improve livelihoods because that's really the key to all this. 
and the incentives based payments, which I think Art will talk about later, in ha how that actually happens. But going back to what the Governor was saying, that, that, that the master plan is an overall approach and the master plan covers four, I think, four peak domes, which are very similar to this, very similar um, physical makeup, very similar sociological makeup. So that's the, so I guess what the landscape, some people might assume that's the landscape approach. Now that, that whole area is very characteristic, as I said um, in the opening, that about half of Indonesia's um, um, peatlands are in that condition. So this is a sort of a, a small glimpse as to what is happening in many of Indonesia's peatlands. So in terms of scaling up, we're looking at methodologies that follow what's actually in the master plan, which then gives a very good indication, if that works, how in the Indonesia might go about meeting its 26% um, targets, or even in fact rehabilitating some of this degraded land, not from a greenhouse gas point of view, but strictly from improving people's um, lives and, and their livelihoods and, and their, their state of health in many cases, particularly in the peatlands, which as we know, um, during the dry season when they burn, very, very noxious gases are released by this peatland and it has very long-lasting effects on, on the health. I think there's some reports were done on that in the, from the 97, 98 fires. So we know what's happening each time these areas burn from a health and economic point of view. So it's more than just the rehabilitation for greenhouse gases. It's very much linked to improving livelihoods and making them more sustainable. Thank you, Grant.